I enjoyed the game. Oh. Honestly, I was good at it. See, it's the simple things that make you good. It's not that you can uh, shoot straighter than anybody or run uh, faster than anybody. No, it's, um, it's your senses. They get very sharp. You learn to cook and eat what's out there. You learn where to find water. You know where not to walk. As simple as that. If it's too easy, don't do it. There's going to be something you're going to step on and somebody's going to get blown to hell. If it looks too easy, it is. <laughs> hey, son, don't you let nobody smoke around you when you're in a dense area. Just don't ever light up in the jungle. Yeah. And don't you leave anything behind that they can use. And you use everything you can that, that they leave behind. And don't let your radio antenna stick up off your head. Man, tie that son of a bitch down. Throw your poncho over it so don't look like a radio. And don't be coming up to me with a handset in your hand. Just don't ever run behind my ass. And don't you never holler medic and call him out in the open and I'll shoot you myself. Now, you sure don't want to put a new man on point, and I don't care what you see on TV or in the movies, and never, never, never put dumbass on your best weapon, your M60 machine gun. You want somebody that's strong enough to handle that gun, somebody that's good enough and brave enough to stay with that gun, because it will draw a fire. You're going to want to have two good ammo carriers with him, because a rapid rate of fire can be a lifesaver. You're going to want a blooper gun or an M79 grenade launcher, man. You've got to know who your skilled people are. You've got to know how to use them. You've got to protect them. You've got to count paces, so you know how far you've come. Even if you're crawling, and you're counting paces. If you're smart, you're going to count a little rope so you can tie knots in it every time. You go 100 paces, 100 meters, you tie a knot. That's how you do it when you can't see nothing. Man, there is 100,000 ways to make a booby trap. You better learn to recognize them because if you don't bounce them, better, <coughs> she's going to take you off at the waist. Son, you're going to be a double amputee. Yeah. Yes, I enjoyed combat. I enjoyed the game. I just did that to get your attention. <laughs> Did I get it? Good. Uh, that, was, uh, that was the late Staff Sergeant Nick Bacon awarded our nation's highest military decoration, the Medal of Honor for conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty. On August 26, 1968, west of Tam Chi, Republic of Vietnam. Sergeant Bacon is one of eight Medal of Honor recipients in Beyond Glory, a solo theater piece I created back in 2003, and I've performed it somewhere between three and 400 times since then, and I thought I'd take about 18 minutes to tell you why and uh, how it fits in. We shoehorn it into the theme of this gathering, what makes a good society. Well, here's another quote. The purpose of playing, both at the first and now, was and is, to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. Well, as regards the theme of this conference, there you have it. This quote posits that acting is greater than sheer entertainment, but is a form of truth-telling. The speaker is insisting that action is to be articulated in the most very similar manner, sans bombast and sentimentality, that this is, in fact, the moral imperative of the theater. I accept these words as gospel. After all, they're spoken by Hamlet, the master role from the master himself. The age and body of the time, it appeared pretty fractured back in 2003, appears even more so today, the divisiveness in our nation, culturally, economically, politically, philosophically, religiously, it troubled me then, it troubles me now. I was pretty fractured myself back then, back then but, but I am much less so today. And I know that Beyond Glory has had a lot to do with my own coming to terms with my own form and pressure. Now, looking back, I think I can illustrate my own sense of personal fracture by, by my feelings about the invasion of Iraq. You know, there's a phrase that's become something of a, of a catch basin. I am against the war, but I support the troops. That's how I feel. But it's problematic. If you're against the war, you demonstrate. At least you do if you're part of my generation. But if you do demonstrate, well, what message does that send to our troops? Probably not a message of support. And you know, 
the awareness of the unearned scorn and derision that was heaped on the men and women who served in Vietnam, both during and particularly upon returning from that war, and a commitment to never allow that to happen again, well, in my view, it created something of a moral dilemma in terms of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, I'm all for moral dilemmas. They're useful. They force you to think things through and decide where you really stand. What was unfortunate in 2002 and 3 was the way that this dilemma was unnecessarily exacerbated by bombast, sometimes sentimental, often vicious, from the right, which essentially equated dissent at very best with being unpatriotic and at worst with being treasonous. And by the way, what makes a good society? Dissent. In any case, there was very little of it. A predictable and nearly unanimous majority of congressional Republicans voted aye for the Iraq War Resolution of 2002. Somewhat shockingly, a strong, oh, that's not the right word, uh, a cowed, no, uh, an uneasy plurality of Democrats voted aye as well. I didn't have to vote. My way of dealing with it, I wrote Beyond Glory. I adapted it for the stage from Larry Smith's book, Beyond Glory, Medal of Honor Heroes in Their Own Words. By the way, heroes is a word that the publishers insisted upon. Larry Smith didn't want it, and the recipients, living Medal of Honor recipients all, would never ever use the word to characterize themselves. I felt, but heroes they were, and I felt that the unvarnished truths contained, in, contained in, the, in this book was a way to approach some of the divisions within my own self, within, within the country. I wanted to create an experience that all Americans could relate to, but that was not diluted and not, not namby-pamby, that had some teeth. Beyond glory is shorn of politics. There's no flag waving in it. Neither does it examine the morality of any specific conflict, or indeed the morality of war itself. It takes war as a given, and it examines some of the fundamental qualities and behaviors that war gives rise to. It's not above politics, it's just quite aside from politics. It is not there to threaten or to persuade both legitimate objects of the theater, but I wanted to be deeply inclusive, and I emphasize deeply, not the cheap, cloying sentiment of talk show hosts or political stumpers, but an examination, a meditation on some of the most fundamental themes that bind us together, not only as Americans, but as human beings. Themes of courage and fortitude, faith, fiber, and humility. Themes articulated not by bombast and sentimentality, but by actions recalled in truthful and simple words. You know what the hardest thing was? The the hardest thing was laying there all night, listening to them beg for their mamas, all these young boys crying out for their mummies. That was the perversity of it. You see them telling me I did a good job. When all these young men are dying, it's not very glamorous, no sir, it isn't. It is not a good story, but then I guess it's consistent with war. Words, words like bravery, courage, they come after the fact they are retroactive, retrospective type words. I think the biggest thing you find if you read the citations is there was a feeling that somebody had to do something. I did what I did because it was my job. And if I didn't do it, none of us were going to get out. My name is Clarence Sasser. Now, Clarence Sasser, medic, Mekong Delta, Vietnam. Clarence is still very much alive, but when I began work on Beyond Glory, all eight recipients were alive. Three remain, reason enough to tell these stories. Now, Clarence Sasser is black. I initially had some apprehensions about the propriety of my playing a black man. I got over it. 
It adds to the tour de force nature of the piece. You know, I play another black recipient as well, Vernon Baker from the 92nd, the fabled Buffalo Division. I never did get to meet Mr. Baker, although he did sign off on me doing the show, as did all of the recipients. But I always had a fantasy of, of knocking on Vernon Baker's door in the woods of Idaho, and Mr. Baker answers the door with his trusty M1 30-06 in hand. <laughs> and I introduce myself by saying, Mr. Baker, my name is Stephen Lang, and I portray you in Beyond Glory. And Vernon Baker lowers the rifle, and he says, Hmm, well, I always figured it would be Morgan. <laughs> or maybe Denzel. But you would certainly be my third choice. <laughs> as long as I'm in the voice, I went back down that draw, up that hill the next day. Only people left on that hillside were my dead men. And they're all barefooted. The enemy were gone. But they'd taken the boots and the socks off a dead man. My commission expired in 47, but I re-upped. In order to stay in, I had to go down to Master Sergeant, but I have no complaints. Look, this was the only country I had, and I felt in my heart that things would get better, that America, the United States, was growing up. Look at Colin Powell. I retired in 68, then in, in 96, I get a call from a university professor who asked me, what do you know about the Medal of Honor? And I thought, who the hell is this nut? <laughs> but it, he told me the army was investigating why no black Americans received the Medal of Honor during World War II. And he would like to come and talk to me. And I received the Medal of Honor on a cold January afternoon in 1997 from President Clinton. Seven were awarded that day, but I was the only one still walking around. When the president put that blue ribbon around my neck, I was thinking of 19 bootless man left on a hillside. <laughs> Difficult words. Huh? I'm sure that so many of you are aware that veterans are so reluctant to speak about their experiences in combat. You know, I know my uncle Sonny, World War II vet, a Marine. He never spoke about the invasion of Guam, although being a Marine was at the core of his own self-definition, his own sense of self-worth. And of course, Medal of Honor recipients are justly proud of their service, but they're no less reluctant to speak. It necessarily entails revisiting scenes of, of death and mayhem of the most intense and bloody variety. I mean, that's part of the criteria for receiving the decoration, a decoration, by the way, that is awarded posthumously a full 70% of the time, and add to that the fact that there's a certain confusion and, and sometimes guilt for being lionized, not only for excelling at the madness of war, but for having survived when so many good pals died. So for Larry Smith, a fine writer, to persuade 27 Medal of Honor recipients from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam to tell their stories was a hell of a journalistic coup and a great service. Beyond Glory was premiered April 2004 at the theater at the Women in Military Service Memorial, which is literally, literally located at the front gate of Arlington National Cemetery. Chance of war that brought us there. No other theaters were available at the time, but it couldn't have been more fitting. The themes of honor and humility and sacrifice resonated all the more deeply surrounded as we were by so many thousands of our honored dead. 
But for a time, the theater itself resembled a graveyard. Beyond Glory was the first play ever mounted there. The venue had previously been used for lectures, and the Washington Theater audience was simply unaware of our existence. At the outset, I played to sparse houses. Many previews I played to an audience of three or six. There's an old saw in the theater. It says that if the audience outnumbers the cast, rather than perform the show, you declare victory and retire to the nearest tavern. <laughs> that, no doubt, was concocted by an actor. I remember mentioning this to my producer, who happened to be my sister, <laughs> who replied that while this may very well be true, the fact was mine was a solo show, <laughs> and the only way I could outnumber the audience was if nobody showed up which never, in fact, actually did happen. I did point out, however, that I played eight roles. So the question of cast size was open to interpretation, <laughs> to which she, with no originality whatsoever, reposted, the show must go on, a phrase undoubtedly coined by a producer. <laughs> but playing Beyond Glory to virtually empty houses turned out to be an extraordinary exercise in focus and concentration, not to mention humility, and I would not have traded that experience for the world. And then a rave review in the Washington Post turned things around, and the people came. I don't usually quote reviews, but the final sentence of the Post still warms me. Beyond glory is as stirring as taps at dusk. To me, that meant that the play was doing what it set out to do. These stories, they're remarkable, instructive. I've given you a taste. Each man speaks in a unique and vivid voice with a full range of emotion and candor, irony, humor, sadness, warmth, bitterness, and wonder. Each man has had a lifetime to reflect on his own day of destiny and the conclusions that each one has drawn about the nature of courage and bravery, of chance and fortune, of life and death, were deeply informed, deeply exciting, and to me, deeply dramatic. And through an unlikely partnership between the Department of Defense and the National Endowment for the Arts, <laughs> I have been fortunate enough to play Beyond Glory for troops across the globe, from Guam to Guantanamo, from the Persian Gulf to the DMZ that divides the Koreas. And on the floor of the U.S. Senate, in celebration of Daniel Inouye's 80th birthday, our longest serving senator, senior senator from Hawaii, Medal of Honor recipient who lost his right arm on a high ridge called Kole Musatello while fighting with the 442nd, the Nisei Division, the Japanese American Division, the Expendables. The day I went off to war, my father accompanied me to the military pickup point. We rode the streetcar all the way from home. During the ride, my father never said a word. He was not a talkative fellow. He just looked straight ahead, and I looked straight ahead. And finally, my father cleared his throat, and he said, America has been very good to us. America has given me two jobs, given you and your sisters and your brothers education. We all love this country. Whatever you do, do not dishonor your country. Remember, never dishonor your family. And if you must give your life, do so with honor. I knew exactly what he meant. I said, yes, sir. Goodbye. That's why I wrote the show. What does mankind need? It's pretty basic. Clean air, 
fire, water, salt, bread, and stories. I don't know if it makes a good society. I think a good story does. But the stories that we tell, they illuminate our past, they inform our future, and sometimes they make the present easier to bear. At bedtime, around the fire, to the tribe, to the family, to the children, to the nation. Thank you.